thing. Pause, believe me. From yeah. the stress and the angst. Yeah, yeah. It's a tough time for us. Uh, well, I'm glad we have Shamal anyway. Mm -hmm. So I uh, will be welcoming. Yeah, Sandra, I think we can we can start. Oh, it's, it's almost ten after. So good. Oh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome back to the Shamal Forum a most distinguished historian, whom I can proudly refer to with his permission as a Shemmel regular. Though the circumstances that affect us are all required that we're together via Zoom, in these, in these pandemic days, we can say that it's the new and we hope temporary normal. Dr. Logoval has chosen a subject that calls into notice his profession as an historian, his prescience as a thinker, and his bravado as a lecturer. He's had to have at least two scenarios in hand and perhaps neither was quite on target. Never before have we had a presidential ele election in which we had concern about our continuation as a democracy. On the way to today, over the last several weeks, we have heard loud and clear and every day from every source, the word vote. That has been most comforting at a time and perhaps the only time that a presidential candidate attempted to suppress the vote. The face mask I've worn all through the fall says voting matters. I've taken it off. I have another face mask. I won't continue on this note as we are eager to hear from this distinguished caller and loyal friend of Shemo, uh, Lawrence D. Belfer, Professor of International Affairs at Harvard University. Fred Logoval will speak on what democracy requires the 2020 election in historical perspective. Fred. Welcome. Well, it's so good to be with you. And I thank you, Sandra. I thank Allison. I thank uh, the whole crew. Uh, I am indeed a kind of a regular, I'm so happy to say. Uh, and uh, I'm only sorry, of course, that you know we're not doing this as we normally do and have done in the past, and I hope we'll do in the future, which is, of course, together in one room. Yes. A nice, uh, a nice tasty lunch, followed by um, followed by a presentation and then Q and A. But what we can do, I hope, is um, still have the last part of that. I'll present, give you some observations, and then in this virtual format, <clears throat> which I'm sure Sandra and Allison have perfected, uh, we will have uh, am ample time for some from for some Q and A, and of course. You know. We have the, ample people who love to have Q and A. <laughs> well, this is great, and I know that from past visits. Uh, that's you know, and I I think I've said this probably in most years, guys. Which is, I also say in other settings, and that is that the Q and A. Uh, it's always my favorite part of all this, and so um, yeah. so we should we should we should be sure, and we will be sure to 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 do that. Of course, when Sandra and I were talking about topics, as we do every year before I come, usually mm -hmm. about oh, I don't know, three, four, five months before my visit. <clears throat> we knew that this would be a timely um, <laughs> timely subject to be discussing, of course, because we knew that it was going to fall two days after the election. I don't think we quite knew that yeah, it would yeah. be, we would still be in, a pro in the process of, of, of uh, you know, digesting the results, not even fully yeah, knowing yeah. the results. Um, and yet here we are. And so I've had to think about over the last day and a half, precisely what I should say. Uh, and I've kept one eye on the computer, uh, have hit refresh a little bit too often, probably for my own well-being uh, on, the, on, the, on the numbers. Yeah. But, um, but I, I still think, and you'll have to tell me whether you disagree, I still think we can think about this in historical perspective uh, and uh, contextualize this election a bit. You know, I did a, I did an, in an interview, this tells you something about the global scope of this thing. Uh, I did an interview election night. So Tuesday night, 7.30 hour time in Cambridge and, uh, and in Scranton uh, with Swedish public radio, basically the national uh, radio system in Sweden, which mm -hmm. meant that it was 1.30 in the morning in Sweden. Yeah. And it was very clear, both from that interview and from what my friends and relatives, I'm originally from Sweden, as I think some of you know, uh, what they were saying, that 
this little country in the in Scandinavia was up much of it was up all night long because it wanted to know what was going on the, the host before we went on the air jokingly said but only half jokingly actually he said uh something like um in translated words this is the most important election in Swedish history um uh and um you know half jokingly of course because their own elections matter a lot but the point is the world has been waiting on this for a long time. We continue to wait, um, and uh, that's where we are. I think it's created stress for a lot of us, or maybe I'll speak for myself here. And I'm mindful of the fact that I thought this was maybe worth passing on to all of you, even if I'm speaking mostly to myself. I'm mindful of the fact that that we tend, when we are uncertain as human beings, when we're stressed as human beings, we tend to not think realistically about a situation. Um, we tend to assume the worst. If my candidate loses, it's the end of everything. I won't be able to take it if that happens. Um, so I think what we tend to do, this is what the psychologists at least tell us, including my colleagues here at my university, they tell us that we tend to overestimate, we tend to exaggerate how a specific event is going to affect our happiness in the future. So I'm telling myself these last 36 hours that that could be the case here because I can fall into that sort of thinking. Um, so, but um, what I wanna do is spend a half hour or so talking about democracy, not really from the standpoint of political philosophy. I wanna talk about it in the more specific American context which we are in and um, try to connect the his history to where we are today. An important point I wanna make at the outset, uh, I, I think we all know this, but it's an, it's an important thing to remember is that elections have been contested, bitterly contested in many cases throughout American history. 2000 of course comes to mind, Bush v. Gore, 1876 is another one that comes to mind. And very often we should remember folks, the counting takes a long time. Um, in the 19th century, it was normal for it to be at least several days, sometimes longer. Um, and that's, that's okay. It's a critically important thing that the votes be counted. I think we would all agree. That's the essence indeed of representative democracy, a complete and accurate count is the only way to determine the will of the people who have cast ballots. It's a commonsensical thing. And the process will take days, even in more recent times. And in the highest turnout election in, we don't have the final figures, but certainly the highest turnout election we've seen in a very long time. Some have, some have suggested more than a century. Um, in a pandemic, in a situation in which many Americans chose to vote by mail or cast early ballots, uh, no wonder that it's that it's uh, it seems to me at least that it's um, taking longer than it normally would. And again, Bush v. Gore in two thousand, uh, I think it was December eleventh or twelfth before we had a final result in that election. So more than a month in that case. Uh, I think um, I think 1874 Rutherford B. Hayes several weeks of negotiating before he was uh, before he became uh, president, um, and of course, again, more recent elections too. When you think about it, military personnel who are stationed overseas, their their ballots have often come in after the fact. It hasn't typically affected the outcome, which is why we don't think about it so much. But it's a big country. We've got let's say 150 million voters, give or take. That's gonna be a complicated thing to do. Again, the Swedes uh, reminded me of this the other night. You've got a country in Sweden of about 10 million people. So maybe though they have higher turnout than we have, maybe five or 6 million will vote in an election. That's a much easier proposition than what we face here. Uh, and you've got poll workers, let's remember this people poll workers and their supervisors 
who have been committed to the job that they're doing for a long time, working really long hours to make sure that every ballot is counted. I think we, at least I tend to not think about these poor people who are toiling in the trenches at, as it were and doing this. So it's in some ways, I guess the point I'm making here is that this is to be expected. Uh, we're gonna see, I think in the future, in, 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 in the next elections, we're gonna see more lags like this because more people I think will rely on mail voting, mail in voting. It shows that the system is working. Um, and again, I think that the coronavirus, I've already made this point, but I'll just repeat it, that COVID-19 has profoundly altered how millions of Americans have voted. Commonsensical assertion, but let's remember this. I think in the last election, the figure that I saw was that about 45 million people voted early, cast early ballots last time around. This time it was a slightly over a hundred million people. And that's of course driven largely by the pandemic. And you can imagine why in urban areas in particular, people might say, hmm, I could wait until election day, stand in long lines potentially, or I could vote early or vote by mail. Uh, and of course, so many of them have done so. This is one reason why, this is why I'm, I don't wanna get partisan, but one reason why I'm concerned about the president's assertion late on election night, <clears throat> and which he has repeated since then, and his supporters have repeated since then, uh, I think it's irresponsible to suggest that he had won and that the voting must stop. He tweeted this morning, as we, you know, as we speak practically, stop the count, in all caps, was a tweet this morning. But there's a positive, a positive assertion that I think is is easy to miss and that we should bear in mind, which is <clears throat> that the heavy turnout, if delays are to be expected, and that was my first point, my second one is that the heavy turnout people, ladies and gentlemen, is a sign that the system is working. Uh, in a fundamental way, um, uh, it also shows the strength of American democracy. It's still lower than in many other countries percentage wise, but I think we should celebrate the fact that so many people thought this was important, think this is important, made the effort to go out and vote, uh, and we're seeing that in a really high turnout election. Another positive thing. <clears throat> um, there were warnings in the last couple of weeks that we might see violence in the streets on election day especially if the tally was close, especially if the outcome was uncertain. Uh, you'll, you'll probably have seen the images of businesses in New York City and, and, and Philly and elsewhere boarding up their storefronts <clears throat> uh, in anticipation of possible violence. And at least to this point, we haven't seen it. Um, a final sort of uh, prefatory point, if I, if I may. We, we should not assume, ladies and gentlemen, that the divisions that we're seeing in our electorate are wholly new. Again, this is something I think you all know as students of history. This is an August group uh, which I'm addressing today. But maybe it's a good thing for all of us to remember that uh, we've been divided uh, in this country as a nation, as an electorate, really since the founding of the Republic. The divisions are deeper now, and I may come back to that, and it's a source of concern, but let's remember that um, Americans have always been divided, at least to a degree. And you could even argue, this is something I've researched and we can discuss if you want in the Q&A, that those halcyon days, those supposedly glorious days of bipartisan cooperation in the early years after World War II, the bipartisan Cold War consensus, as it was called, really more, um, more apparent in hindsight, I guess I could say, than they were at the time. If you actually go back and look at what the two parties said, 
in the late 40s, in the 50s, um, into the 60s, uh, there were a lot of divisions. Americans were divided at least substantially then too. So let's also remember that, that this is part of who we are as a people uh, and we have been able to work through them much of the time, um, but um, those divisions have been there. All of that said, when those sort of positive bits um, by way of introduction, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that our splits are deeper now than they've been at least in recent memory. I'm concerned that the very concept of public trust in an established set of facts that I think are necessary for the operation of a democratic society have, you know, that that, that has eroded in the past few years. And that may have potential long-term ramifications. Again, I think the statements by the president and his supporters over the last 24 hours, the last you know day and a half or so, could contribute further to that erosion. And so I do think it's not too alarmist to say that the legitimacy of the American political system is at least under some threat, maybe more than that. And we can talk further about that. Um, as we speak again, I think we are proceeding so it seems we may be shifting even as we talk through the next hour or so, but we're proceeding in an orderly, peaceful, uh, to, to an orderly and peaceful conclusion to this election. State officials, as far as I can see, I checked shortly before we, before we all met today, state officials are continuing to diligently uh, do their counting. Um, that's a really good thing. But we're going to have a challenging time ahead, I think, for this thing we all love called the American experiment. Uh, we could have some stormy weather ahead. We should prepare for that. Um, we've had bad periods of bad weather in the past, gotten through them. I think we can get through this. I think I've said to you all previously in one of the previous forums, maybe more than one, that I became a citizen in 2008. And uh, I'll never forget the words that the judge spoke. At that point, I was living in Ithaca, New York, but the powerful words um, that he spoke to all of us who were becoming citizens. I was the only Swede, go figure. Um, but he spoke about the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. And I realized that this is a marvelous thing. Uh, this thing we call American democracy. Uh, and I was, I felt really privileged and feel privileged to, to have been in part of that service and to have the, this citizenship. But it could be a tough time ahead. What I wanna do, uh, two things I wanna do in my remaining time. I wanna talk a little bit about um, a figure who can be, um, um, we can learn from a certain person who I'm working on now. I'm writing a two volume biography of John F. Kennedy. The first volume was just published about seven weeks ago. Uh, it's the first of two volumes. And so I'm deeply immersed in the career of, and the life and the career of our 35th president, JFK. And I wanna talk a little bit about JFK because he thought long and hard as it turns out about democracy and what is required in a democracy, the very title of today's talk. So I'll talk a little bit about JFK. Then I wanna finish before we go to Q&A by connecting it back to today, talk a little bit about Joe Biden. Um, at, this, at this moment, we don't know, you know whether he will take uh, office as our 46th president. Maybe we'll find out uh, while we're doing this, but um, because of his own connection to JFK, uh, because, of course, he spent his, his, uh, his early years right there with you in Scranton. Uh, I want to say just a few words about him. And in particular, just to, just to sort of anticipate what I'm going to say, talk a little bit about his commitment to bipartisanship. How realistic is it in this, in this time of deep um, uh, division? Um, but I'll, as I said, I'll come back to that point. So what I'm trying to do with JFK... Um, I hope with success, is to look at him straight in the eye. I talk about this in the preface to this first volume. I don't want to look at him up in veneration. 
I don't want to look at them down in, um, in condescension, but to look at him straight in the eye, look at his strengths, his weaknesses, his successes, his failures. Uh, and there were, there were certainly, there were certainly both uh, throughout his life. And so I deal with him. But my point that I think is relevant here for us today is that he did think long and hard about democracy and what is required in a democracy. Uh, because I do think it has resonance for us today. Um, here, I think it's worth noting people that Kennedy's approval rating, and I think it's connected to his faith in democracy. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. But Kennedy's approval rating is the highest of any post-war president, both while he was in office and after the fact. By the middle of 1963, so this is about four or five months before his assassination, <clears throat> so toward the end of his life, toward the end of his presidency, middle of 63, close to 60% of Americans claimed that they had cast ballots for him in 1960. Whereas in fact, only about 49%, 49.7% had actually cast ballots for Kennedy in 1960. After his death, by an assassin's bullet that November, this landslide increased to, uh, to, 60, uh, to 65%. So after his death, it went up even higher than the number of people who claimed they had voted for him. Also noteworthy here is that um, his approval rating, his average approval rating while in office so this is not after the fact, this is while he's in office, was 70%, which is the highest among post-war, post-1945 post presidents. Later generations would rate his, uh, his presidency even higher. Now it's true, I know what some of you are thinking, he didn't have a second term. And what typically happens in second terms is that approval ratings will uh, decline a little bit. So we should bear that in mind in thinking about his figures. But even adjusting for that, I feel confident in saying that his, his numbers in office and after the fact are higher than either the people before him after 1945 or since. Also interesting is that his support cut across party lines. Even though Kennedy's policies were mostly in the mainstream of the Democratic Party, uh, in one survey from 2012, for example, 79% of Democrats <laughs> excuse me, 79% of Democrats and 52% of Republicans called him one of the nation's best leaders. Whereas other post-war presidents, including those who won two terms, uh, have been often deeply unpopular with the opposite party. How do we explain? I'm sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so this is why I'm struggling a little bit in speaking, but how do we explain his enduring appeal Historians often point to his graceful and dignified bearing, to his charisma, to the glamour of his administration. Sometimes they point to the horrible circumstances of his death, which was captured on film and which plays as a kind of endless loop in our minds as a result. But I think that more than anything, more than anything, what explains his continuing appeal was his faith in his nation and its democratic brand of politics. I wanna talk about that just a little bit. I'm keeping an eye on the clock here, people, so, so we'll um, make sure not to go over. I suggest in the preface to volume one, which was again published um, just a few weeks ago, that by his inspirational leadership and his speech making, Kennedy elevated Americans' faith in the capacity of government to address major needs and speak to society's highest aspirations. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, that in our corrosively cynical age that we live in today, I think it's good to remember that it wasn't always so. In fact, we only need to go back about 60 years, five, half a century, a little more, to know that there was a different time. And, and what's interesting also is how early 
Kennedy was thinking about these things. So I deal with this obviously in the book, um, uh, already in his undergraduate papers here at Harvard, Kennedy grappled with questions concerning political leadership. And I think those questions would, <coughs> would fascinate him, would vex him to the end of his days. Now, bear in mind that this is the late 1930s we're talking about. So the storm clouds are gathering in Europe and he continues this even after the Germans invade Poland and World War II in Europe begins. Can the Western democracies, young JFK wondered, as by the way, did, did established leaders like, uh, or figures like Winston Churchill, like the columnist Walter Lippmann, many people were wondering, do the democracies have what it takes to stand up to the Nazis in Europe, to the Japanese in the Far East? Um, it's an open question to them and I think to young JFK. And is it possible, for example, he said in his college papers, and we can see some of these college papers at the Kennedy Library just down the street from where I'm sitting. Um, the young Kennedy wondered, is it possible for democratic leaders to respond nimbly and effectively in times of national or international crisis? How can policymakers reconcile their sense of the nation's interests with the fickle demands of their constituents? What's the nature of political courage? What can politicians do when their constituents want them to do one thing and they feel like what would be best for the nation is to do another thing? In one of his undergraduate papers, young JFK wrote as follows, and I quote, unless democracy can produce able leaders, its chances of survival are slight. That's, I think, the fall of 1939. Uh, so in his senior year, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, he wrote that point. And then in his senior thesis, I won't talk about that much here, but it's a fascinating document. It was written that final year, 3940, really looking closely at British appeasement, appeasement policy and, and, its, and its rise in the 1930s, why the British were, were seemingly unprepared for the Nazi uh, onslaught. That was the subject of Kennedy's senior thesis. It was published as a book soon after his graduation. So in the middle of 1940, just as France is falling, this book comes out from this young college graduate called Why England Slept, becomes a minor bestseller. Pretty extraordinary for a 23-year-old who's just graduated from college to, to have that happen. In his campaigns, I won't, again, I'll just mention this briefly, um, beginning in 1946, when he runs for the 11th district for the House of Representatives here at uh, Massachusetts, but for the, for the US House, skinny 29-year-old, just back from the service from the South Pacific. He is again resounding themes that I think are important for us today and say a lot about him. For example, he says to campaign audiences, sometimes really small audiences, because this is just a young kid running for, uh, albeit uh, from a pretty famous family, but he's a young kid running for Congress. So the, the audiences were often pretty small. By the way, he wrote these speeches also mostly by himself. But he says, for example, um, beware lazy cynicism about politics and politicians. For the survival of American democracy ultimately depends on civic duty, on having an engaged and informed citizenry that embraces the call to public service. That's a theme in these early speeches. Pretty, pretty interesting, actually. Um, and of course, if we jump ahead to his famous inaugural address, 1961, one of the most remarkable inaugural addresses in American history, I would argue, certainly in the 20th century. We can discuss it if you're interested. It's going to be important in volume two of my book, which I'm just starting to do to research and to write uh, now. But in that inaugural address, he would, he would speak to these themes. And what's remarkable is that you that already in 46, 15 years before, he's already discussing these things. Again, in speeches he wrote by himself. He added a corollary in, another, in, in other speeches in 1946, <clears throat> which I think is important. And it connects to Biden, who I want to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, Bedrock principle of JFK's, I would say, is that effective politics in a democracy 
must involve mutual give and take by people acting in good faith. You need to have serious negotiation between the parties um, in order for democracy to work. He said this in one of his speeches in 46. I want to just quote briefly from it. In America, politics are regarded with great contempt and politicians themselves are looked down upon because of their free and easy compromises. It is well for us to understand that politicians are dealing with human beings with all their varied ambitions, desires, and backgrounds. And many of these compromises cannot be avoided." Unquote. That's JFK. So we see right here, right down to the end in Dallas, uh, the assassination in, of November of 63, that he's speaking, um, he's speaking in, a say, in a sense, the language of inclusion. I guess I could say, emphasizing Americans' common goals, common fate as a people. In other words, emphasizing more what Americans have in common rather than what sets them apart. He's also emphasizing the, comp the concept of shared sacrifice. Really powerful stuff in my view. I should note that at no point in his career, those of you who, who know JFK's career will know what I'm talking about. At no point in his career was he above, you know, bare knuckle politics. Uh, he was not above partisan skirmishing, if I can put it that way. But from the start, John F. Kennedy understood, again, that good faith, <clears throat> good faith bargaining between the parties was necessary to the system's functioning. Mutual respect, JFK believed, and I think he practiced this. Even his opponents would say this. Mutual respect in the public realm is um, ennobling, maybe that's a good word, <clears throat> helping Americans to see political opponents as adversaries, not enemies. That's a very important distinction, especially in our own day and age. He elaborates the points in a very, I think, remarkable book, his book, 19, 1956 book, Profiles and Courage. I won't talk about it here, we can come back to it. I think I mentioned it I quoted from it in a previous uh, uh, talk to this group, I think two years ago, um, I, I quoted from Profiles and Courage. We can come back to it, but the point is he emphasizes these themes in that book, 1956. So it's towards the end of my first volume. Uh, the first volume ends in 56 with JFK's decision that he's definitely gonna run in 1960. And then my second volume, we'll look at that campaign We'll look at his abbreviated, <laughs> excuse me, his abbreviated presidency and his assassination. But the book, I want to at least mention it here, is worth spending time with because I think it has a lot of contemporary resonance for us today. Profiles and courage. Um, and so third, final thing I'll just mention, and then I want to just conclude with a comment or two about Joe Biden. Or and and for that matter, Donald Trump as well, because I think it's going to be, it's going to uh, it's going to pertain to whoever takes uh, office uh, in January. But the third thing that Kennedy insisted upon being a, a requirement for democracy, to go back to our theme of the day, um, is that is an insistent insistence on his part. This is true while he's in Congress. It's true when he's in, 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 the, in the Oval Office. An insistence on reasoning from evidence. He insisted while president that his advisors, there's lots of evidence of this. He wanted his advisors, both at the high level and at the middle level, to know their stuff. They quickly learned that they, they needed to know their stuff uh, if they were going to go into a meeting with, with JFK. He himself prided himself on uh, studying the, the issues down to the narrow details. Often he knew more about an issue than anybody else in the room. And this was an emphasis on his, throughout, uh, respect for expertise and an insistence on having expertise. I should emphasize people, doesn't always mean that you get, you get wise policies as a result. Uh, we of course have to mention um, Vietnam. David Halberstam called his, his 
phenomenal book, which I've written about uh, in various places. He called his book on, on Vietnam policymaking, The Best and the Brightest. And the title was used ironically because it was the Kennedy and Johnson teams made up of highly educated people who always prided themselves on reasoning from evidence that led us into the quagmire in Southeast Asia. So we shouldn't assume necessarily that as long as you have the experts, everything is gonna be great. Nevertheless, he believed strongly that public policy can only work uh, if you reason from evidence. And I think he, um, he practiced that um, accordingly. I think it has resonance for us today. All right, let me sum up. Where does this leave us? Well, uh, partly I'm not sure where it leaves us. Um, I think there are hopeful elements in this election, as I said at the outset. The big turnout in particular, I think is encouraging in many ways. I also noted at the outset that we've always been divided to some degree, uh, the American electorate, that that's something we should remember. That's par for the course in this strange and wondrous thing called American democracy. But I will also candidly admit here as I conclude that, that the Kennedy example can seem, uh, what's the word, aspirational. Uh, in the short term and maybe even in the medium term, it's hard to imagine that meaningful bipartisan uh, agreement can occur, which is why I want to bring in Joe Biden briefly here at the end. Scranton boy, of course, as a youngster, I think he's quite interesting in this regard. He was inspired, Biden was, <clears throat> partly by Kennedy's example, fellow Catholic. Um, he, he's not JFK. Uh, he lacks, I think, Kennedy's charisma. He lacks Kennedy's fresh-faced appeal. At 78, I think, on Inauguration Day, I think he's 77 now, but I think he'll be 78 by the time. If he were to take uh, the office, he would be 78. He would be America's oldest elected president. Kennedy was America's youngest elected president. He was 43. 43. Um, but here's my thought. If Biden is a kind of political antique, if Joe Biden is out of step with our recent past, in a way, maybe that's to his credit because he remembers what it was like, Joe Biden does, to work together rather than wage the politics of, of, of destruction. I think he's like Kennedy in seeing politics as a noble calling. Um, I think like Kennedy, he believes that government, though it won't solve all our problems, government has a critical role to play in creating a more well-functioning, more equitable society. I think that's a fair assertion. It was interesting, you will remember this, earlier this year, during the primary campaign, when Biden was attacked by his primary opponents for... Uh, mentioning his cooperative legislative work earlier in his career with two segregationist Senate Democrats, James Eastland and Herman Talmadge. Eastland was Mississippi, Talmadge was uh, Georgia. Uh, he was probably pretty kind of clumsy. Uh, Joe Biden can be this way in some in, uh, rhetorically clumsy or, or uh, not super savvy in invoking those two gentlemen. Um, but I think the fundamental point, at least for me, is correct. Sometimes the system demands that we accommodate, even collaborate with colleagues who would ordinarily be staunch foes. I think that's Joe Biden's basic position. Uh, here I was struck by what John Lewis, the late and much heralded uh, Democratic congressman uh, had to say in defending uh, Biden on this very point. Lewis said, and I quote, during the height of the civil rights movement, movement, we worked with people and got to know people that were members of the Klan, people who opposed us, even people who beat us and arrested us and jailed us. We never gave up on our fellow human beings, and I will not give up on any human being. That's Lewis defending Joe Biden. Now, if he were to take office, if he takes office in January of this coming year, um, 
I think it remains an open question uh, how much success he will have. This is going to be a really difficult situation. Uh, January 2021 will not be like January 1961. Our divisions are deeper, as is our cynicism about politics and politicians. Uh, Kennedy had both houses of Congress. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a different time. Social media, which was non-existent in Kennedy's day, and in the climactic days of the civil rights movement that Lewis was referring to, social media often undermines moves toward moderation. It empowers the, the blowhards to attack anyone in a position of authority. That concerns me. But the, the differences should not be overstated. Kennedy won by a razor thin margin in 1960. He faced a divided electorate as he assumed office. He endured criticism from right wing uh, elements throughout his abbreviated time in office, including those who peddled in falsehoods. They called him the Antichrist, some of them. Some said he was a stooge of, of the Soviet Union, of the Kremlin. Uh, some said he was both, which is interesting. Um, he held his ground. And in fact, he insisted, again, on, the, on reasoning from evidence, he said there will always be a diversity of views in the United States. Some aides and his wife, Jackie, were concerned about him taking the trip to Texas, that fateful trip, because of the opposition from these right-wing elements that he would find in Dallas and elsewhere in Texas. So they thought maybe he shouldn't be doing this. But he, of course, waved aside those concerns and he went. And I'll close people and then turn this over to Allison and, and Sandra in terms of uh, the Q&A and where we should go from here. I want to close with the remarks that JFK had planned to deliver to the Dallas Trademark on November 22nd, 1963. So he was on his way to the Trademark when the motorcade passed the Texas uh, School Book Depository uh, and he was um, shot and killed. But he planned to say this at the Dallas Trademark. In a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by learning and reason. Or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality and the plausible with the possible will gain popular ascendancy and with their swimmingly swift, swift and simple solutions to every world problem. We cannot expect, he would have gone on to say, we cannot expect that everyone will talk sense to the American people, but we can hope that fewer people will listen to this nonsense. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone for paying attention. Uh, love to get comments and questions and, and feedback from you. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and I can unmute your mic. Uh, Dr. Tracy, let's see. Can you unmute there? I can't hear you. Yeah, I still see the mute. I still see the mute button. I know. There we go. I speak better with the mute on. <laughs> uh, really terrific talk. Particularly the that last quote was so powerful. Mm. So powerful. But I just want to ask you a question and put in a commercial. Mm. Uh, I read the books you referred to. I, mm. I was I, I, I couldn't get over how long ago, but uh, especially while Europe slept. Uh, mm. Profiles and Courage was enjoyable, but I love that one. But we have a young man from here, Sandra knows, and he's spoken on this forum, who's written, I think, a brilliant book. Brilliant book. Mm. This was um, uh, Tom... Uh, uh, Bauer? Breyer. Breyer, Thomas Breyer. Okay. He just ran for Congress, but he wrote a book, and when I read it, I thought he was a senior professor at some university, and it wound uh -huh. up, he's the grandson of a very good friend of mine. I couldn't believe 
that anybody this young was this. It was the same thing as Kennedy's book, mm. just a commercial, uh, Breyer. And I can't remember the name of the book, Democracy's in it, but I just thought it was outstanding. Now, my question is, yeah. are we ever going to get a, rid of this electoral college? Mm. Because one of the ghosts, one of the scary things in this election was how state legislators propose who's going there and they could just forget about the results of the election. That's my question. Well, and it's a good one. Um, and, you know, again, to just go back briefly to my Swedish interview, I think people around the world, including the Swedes, are just confounded by this. They don't understand how the person with the most votes isn't necessarily the one who's going to be the winner of the election. I guess I would also plug a book uh, since, since you have, uh, and I would plug my colleague Alex Kesar's book, which came out just a few months ago. Um, Alexander Kesar, which is K-E-Y-S-S-A-R. My dear colleague, fellow historian here at Harvard. Um, it's got a very prosaic title, which works. It is something like, why do we still have the Electoral College? And what Alex does in that book, in a way that nobody has done, as you can see, I'm doubling as his publicist, nobody has done before, I think, is look at the history of the Electoral College. Why did we get it in the first place? And maybe more interestingly, through the decades and centuries, uh, why has it persisted? And in fact, he shows that there were various points when it was pretty close to being uh, gotten rid of. Uh, and there have been shifts. Uh, it wasn't always that, you know, the smaller states said, oh, we've got to keep the electoral college because it increases our clout, or we wouldn't have any at least without the electoral college. That wasn't the case at all. Um, and so uh, I guess the, my answer to your question is that I'm skeptical, given what's required, that we're going to get rid uh, any time that I can imagine, maybe in my lifetime, or at least the foreseeable future, this thing called the Electoral College. Uh, there are those who defend it um, on, on serious intellectual grounds, not just on partisan grounds. Um, so there's also, I think, a debate about its merits. Uh, I'm deeply troubled by it. I think that we would have, it would be marvelous to see candidates for the presidency campaigning um, in, for example, California and campaigning in other places that in some ways represent not more of America, but as much of America as the battleground states and, 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 and the, the, the Midwest and so forth. Uh, and that's going to be unlikely as long as we have the Electoral College. But, but I do recommend to you uh, Alex Kesar's book for a sense of why we have it. And at least implicitly, I think he concludes why we're unlikely to see it go anytime soon. Um, I see Phyllis, if you want to unmute yourself or, or Allison, are you handling this or should I? I believe I am unmuted. Perfect. Uh, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Mm. Um, my uh, son-in-law, who works for the Swedish uh, Foreign uh, Affairs, mm. presently uh, posted back in Stockholm, posted a question yesterday on Facebook, and it was, where do you stand, America? And the response to that post was international. Uh, the common theme was that people from Canada, from France, from England are sitting on the edge of their seats waiting to see yep. the results of this election because yep. they believe global democracy depends on yeah. this election. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm fascinated to hear about this and to, to hear that it's that you're, we're talking about your son-in-law. Uh, I think it's true. I think that audiences around the world, my sister lives in Canada and Toronto, uh, and I spent years in Canada before I came to the United States, so after leaving Sweden. But in Canada, and as you say, many other places, uh, people are on the edge of their seat because they understand that the United States, um, even if it's no longer the kind of... Um, 
superpower hegemon that maybe it once was in the Cold War. Uh, it's nevertheless so important. Um, they understand how much this matters. And moreover, I would say, if we know as Americans that, let's say, let's assume that Joe Biden is the next president. We know as Americans that it's unlikely that he will get a lot done because the Senate looks likely to, to remain in uh, Republican hands because of our divisions. Uh, in domestic terms, uh, one would be cautious about what he can accomplish. In foreign policy terms, however, which I think is what matters most to audiences around the world, this matters greatly. Yes. Uh, it has all kinds of implications, even if uh, Biden is uh, severely uh, circumscribed in terms of what he can accomplish at home. They know, the Swedes know, the Canadians know, the Germans know, the Japanese know, and others know that uh, the, 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 the person in the Oval Office, uh, given America's power internationally, given the the continuing power of, of America's um, institutions, its soft power, if you will, as my colleague Joe Nye called it. Um, this just matters a lot. They're waiting. They're probably hitting the refresh button over there as much as we're doing it, uh, as much as we're doing it here. Pear and Linda were up at five in the morning hoping oh. for results. <laughs> oh yeah, I have a I have a good friend who is who is a commentator on Swedish in Swedish media. Uh, he emailed me at six in the morning his time. Uh, and of course, I've been up all night. And he said, I still can't go to bed. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global phenomenon, this thing. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, and I might be treading on some controversial grounds here. Mm. We're at a at a university uh, sponsored event. So you're there at, at Harvard. You've talked about a Harvard graduate, um, and you brought up some in interesting points about good faith bargaining, informed electorate, profiles and courage, respect for expertise, yeah. reason for evidence. But we're full of we're a country full of politicians who have excellent educations. Yeah. They've gone to Harvard. They've mm -hmm. gone to Yale. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Mike Pompeo was first in his class at West Point. Ben Sass, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, mm -hmm. Justice Kavanaugh, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz. I don't know whether he'd give more credit to Princeton than to his law degree, but whatever. And yet we hear from them ideas or uh, thoughts that would seem uh, certainly to JFK to be ridiculous in their terms of uh, the country, democracy, uh, history, uh, all of these things. So I, I'm not sure how to phrase the question. I, yeah. My first thought is where has education failed? Yeah. Um, and what, you know, what can effectively, you know, how long is it gonna take to, to work this, um, yeah. this process through. I think it's a very articulate point and you make it supremely well. Um, and I think it's, it's a tough one. I do think that JFK, if we use him as an example, he spoke at least in part to what you're describing. Um, a little bit, I think, in Profiles and Courage, but this is also we see in one or two of his later speeches and in some of the internal documentation in which he basically uh, blamed, if that's the right word, or at least assigned responsibility for the for the phenomenon that you're describing and that you're describing so well on the perceived need by politicians to speak uh, in language that they think their constituents will support. Uh, they will, according to JFK, dumb down what, the, the, what, what it is that they're saying. They're going to avoid talking about things in complex terms. They're going to be uh, offering simple or even simplistic analyses of problems, even though their education, even though their training, even though their, their minds know better. So he would say that at least part of the phenomenon is, is on account of a kind of... Um, um, 
personal uh, the, the, the 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 seeming demands of their uh, own ambition and what it is they want to see accomplished i don't think david that that's an adequate explanation for it it may be part of what's going on but i think what you're raising um, suggests that there's more to it it can't simply be that they're doing this only to advance either either win an election or a, a re-election or say in pompeo's case become secretary of state and then stay on donald trump's good side uh or uh, with a with a justice uh, uh articulating certain sentiments that may get you tapped for either either a, an appeals court uh, bench or the uh, supreme court I, I, I don't know that I have a better answer. Part of it may be, however, what, what, what Kennedy offered on this. Maybe that's your next book. Yeah. Sandra, yeah. did you? Yeah, I do. Um, I think, um, I think the problem is that politics, one of the problems has been monetized. As everything is about money, um, it, uh, it people yeah. don't feel it's respectable. They just know have to know how much money uh, people can raise in order to, rather than have the kind of credentials, the kind of preparation for not being uh, consumed with money, but yeah. being consumed with the uh, the, uh, the the public good. And I think that um, that's it really spoils, you know, that that money just spoils yeah. the the tradition, and um, it's a problem, a big yeah. problem. I think I think I have not said I have not said the word money. I don't think I've used the word dollars um, in this talk, Sandra. And I think you're you're totally right to bring it back to that and to speak about this as being. If not at the very core of the problems that we're seeing and the, and the, and the, the complexities that we're, we're um, seeing and the divisions that we're experiencing, it's got to be part of this. I'm really glad that you brought this up. Uh, I, I think in Kennedy's era, uh, and indeed you could go much more recently than Kennedy, we did not have this as a, as a, as a problem, at least nearly to the same degree. And by the way, as you all know, or many of you know, this is another thing that international observers find um, deeply confounding. They yeah. do not understand. Right. Uh, many of them have public financing of their campaigns and that's all that they have. They do not understand that yeah. this is something that the United States um, continues to do. Yeah, I think it's one of our problems, not only with our our politics, but our politics is very important because our politics it affects us all. Yeah. But it it has stood in the way of a lot of things that uh, uh, that are important for you know for decent human life. Yeah, can I can I ask a question of you, Sandra, or maybe this is for the whole group? Sure. But since you since you know him, if not personally, at least you know of him uh, well, do you think that Joe Biden's, I think, continuing faith in the prospects of bipartisanship? We could say, Sandra, that it's quaint. Yeah. We could say that it's naive, uh, that you know it doesn't have a prayer uh, in today's Washington. He could say in response, I would say in response, that may be, but ultimately democracy can't survive if you can't have uh, good faith, uh, good faith uh, compromises. But no, I don't know, what's, what's your I, sense? I feel exactly that way. I mean, you know, is it quaint to be honest? Is it quaint to get along with people? Is it, is it quaint to respect people who don't agree with you? No, I think it's uh, correct. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, unfortunately, you know, it shouldn't be old fashioned to tell the truth. You know, it shouldn't be old fashioned to get along with people who don't agree with you, you know, and um, that's, you know, you know, if we, we re I think we really, really need to get past that if we want to really have a democracy. Here, here, I so agree with you.
Uh, other uh, questions, comments from folks? By the way, we do want a democracy. Yeah. 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 Uh, any questions? Jerry there. <laughs> Have another question, huh? Yeah, and then Sheila, I, th I saw Sheila's hand too. We can go to Sheila afterward. Oh, sure. Go to Sheila. Oh, okay, we'll go to Sheila first. Okay. Okay. Sheila, you need to unmute. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I, I just have a question, Professor, and that is, um, in the 60s, I read Profiles of Courage, and I mm. haven't reread it since. I'm a retired high school history teacher, and it still resonates with me. The chapter on Edmund G. Ross, you know, looking mm. down into an empty grave. And, yeah. you know, when we read um, Eric Foner now and so many other historians and scholars, you know, they talk about Andrew Johnson being an unvarnished racist, segregation, oh. you know, pretty much a horrible man. Now, yeah. was a lot of this historical material um, repressed or uh, why do we have such a different view of yeah. him today than Kennedy did? Yeah. And uh, I, I went to a, a very good um, all-girls Catholic high school and academy. And, you know, he, of course, Kennedy was a hero. And that was a book that was so highly esteemed. And Edwin, Edmund G. Yeah. Roth was, you know, held up as a uh, yeah. wealthier, if you will. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's really a, a, a good point. I think it's fair to say, and I, I, I write about this in my book, in, in the book that's come out, the vol volume one. I, I say that the, that profiles encourage some parts of it have not aged well, uh, and in fact, I single out, as I re, if I recall correctly, I single out the Edmund Ross chapter um, because the book missed entirely what you describe and what we now know about Ross and about sentiments of uh, others who were in his circle uh, about the motivations. Um, I will say this to, in response to your question. I think that what Kennedy and his principal collaborator, Ted Sorensen, uh, and the academics that they consulted, because they actually consulted several professional historians, Alan Nevins, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., and others. What they said about Ross in that chapter was consistent with the historical scholarship at the time. So it was only... It was only Sheila in the in the years thereafter, uh, pretty soon thereafter, actually, but after 1956, which is when the book is published, it was only then that historians began to say, now, wait a minute, is this in fact a, 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 a good, accurate portrayal of Ross and of Andrew Johnson? And they began to qualify this. But I don't think, in fact, I'm, I'm quite certain that neither Sorensen nor Kennedy nor any of these historians they consulted were, um, you know, trying to to avoid, uh, were minimizing what they knew about Ross. I think they called it pretty fairly and squarely, based on the historical scholarship at the time. Nevertheless, as I said before, um, certain parts of that book uh have not aged particular have, have aged poorly let's just call it call it uh call it as it is i think the work of eric foner and others demonstrate this i still believe and i and i write about this that the preface to pro or the introduction to profiles and courage the concluding chapter to profiles and courage for me have not lost any of their salience i think people should reread if only those two chapters should reread that portion of the book. I think it has a lot to tell us about where we are today and where we should be going. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, let's see if there are others. Yes, Sharon, please. I am curious from you and from others in our group, to know if people have encountered, as I have listened to friends talk about the reluctance and actually the disinterest of some of the younger people in their families, among their acquaintances, who just were not interested in voting and had no intention mm. of voting yeah. and felt that it really just didn't have anything to do with them. 
And as startling as that was for those of us who hear it and, and are perplexed by it, it was not something that I heard only once or twice no. in this past couple of, of months and year. And I also have to think about one thing that I think that um, that has inspired me since he said it was one of the most important things I think Barack Obama said was as he was leaving, when he was about to get on the helicopter and said, the most important person in democracy and in government is us is individuals. Yeah. And that to me was just so important a message. And, but this piece about people who just don't mm -hmm. think voting matters, and particularly among younger people, what do people yeah. think about that or know about that or say about that? And how do we reverse it? Thanks. Uh, it's a really good point that you make. And maybe somebody else wants to chime on this in on this as well. I think it's a real problem. Uh, I think it's something we've observed in our national elections, never mind local elections, which matter a lot. Uh, state elections, which matter a lot. But if we just focus on the national picture, I think we've seen what you describe, Sharon, um, a lot. Uh, I think this election seems to be different, although you know, I don't think we should read too much into the early signs about a, you know, a, a, a mushrooming and exploding youth vote. Um, uh, I wanna wait until we actually see the figures to see how younger people voted. I do think there's a greater sense, not great enough, but greater sense among more young people that what they say matters, that they can, have, that they can affect ultimately uh, the course of this country and the course of American democracy, that they understand the wisdom of Barack Obama's words, whether they've heard them or not, that you articulated. But I think we have a long way to go. You know, if, if, if at the end of all this, we find out that, uh, I don't know, 62% of American voters, eligible voters, actually cast ballots. Maybe it's higher, maybe it's 64, maybe it's 66, I don't know. But if it's in the sort of low to mid 60s, that's not very good. Better than we've been, but it still means that huge numbers of Americans, even in a time of, of you know, deep polarization, when everybody seems to say that uh, you know, my person has to win this, uh, this election. A very large number of people, including young people, uh, are not um, making the effort. We don't make it necessarily easy. This is another thing that international observers often find is why is it so complicated to vote in the United States? You know, registration, this, that, it differs from state to state. If you go to college in one state, you know, there can be complications in terms of getting yourself registered in, in your home state or in your college state. Maybe young people say, ah, forget it. Um, so we, we, the system doesn't help. Maybe that's part of the answer to your, to your conundrum, but, um, but it's, it's there. I think Sandra, you have a, a, a point too. Yeah. If you're gonna, yeah. I, I think um, I have this sort of motto uh, that, um, when I'm, I think people don't get to, are not well educated civically, which is important, you know, that we need to do more. But I, I feel, I absolutely believe that the most important right we have is the right to be responsible for the public good. Yeah. And I think that um, that's lost a lot. You know, I think yeah. that, uh, People like their rights, whatever whatever the rights are. They usually, but I think I really believe that that's the best right we have. Yeah, and you know, it's and, and to put that a little differently, to go back again to the judge um, in the Tompkins County Courthouse in Ithaca, New York. What I found so powerful about that day when I became a citizen, Sandra, was that it wasn't. He he talked about the rights, but then he said, and there are responsibilities. It's not just about rights. Mm. It's not just about your freedom. I got the freedom to do this. I got the, I have freedom to do that. No, mm. it's also about responsibilities of citizenship. Mm. And that's in part what we're talking about here and where I think, as you pointed out at the start, 
civic education is some piece of this as well. Uh, and that something is lacking in terms of how we are uh, educating uh, young yeah, people. Yeah, because it's a job. Way. I yeah. think it was one of one of the the, the um, Supreme Court judges uh, um, said, uh, in, in American democracy, citizen is the most important job. Yeah. Job. Yeah, yeah. Um, Allison, I'm only able to see the, I'm using a, gal a gallery view. I'm only able to see the first page. So if there's anybody raising a hand on a, I guess I can go back and forth, but. Um, uh, I think maybe well, Sharon, Sharon, did you have a, a, a rejoinder, a comeback? You want to say something uh, briefly? If so, you okay. need to unmute. Yeah. Well, just that I think if everyone had to take that oath of citizenship, it would be so effective yeah. that being born with, being a citizen, being born in, it's something that I don't think we realize. And I yeah. was part of a program at one time where when we were trying to do uh, this kind of uh, education among the people who were in our programs. Um, and we actually had them read and take that oath of citizenship. Mm. And, and I think that's, it's something that we just take for granted until we actually see it in print, read it, and realize that we are born with it. And, other, and listening to you today, it just brings that whole piece of my, of my career back to me. <laughs> yeah. so well, I, it's really well said. I appreciate you saying that. And I'll just, if I can just be a, a briefly plug my own book on this. I do think, I do think the Kennedy story is pretty interesting in this regard. You know, whatever we may say about Joseph and Rose Kennedy, the parents, um, complicated figures, as I show in the book. They did at least some of what you're describing, which is to say they instilled in their nine children from a young age what this citizenship thing what it meant, what it meant to be an American, what it meant to give something back. Um, so there's a role maybe, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, there's a role here for our schools. Yeah. But there's also a role for those of us who have, my kids are now grown. I hope I've given them the, the, to my two kids a, a sense of this. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's on all of us to, to, to instill this and to, to provide this, um, so. Paula, you had a question. Yeah, and then yeah. Patricia, yeah. Um, my, my problem that I think we're gonna have in the future is dealing with the people who have voted against themselves. I talked to so many young women who I know can't afford what they're doing. Single women who voted Republican because they're Republicans. Yeah. They don't understand that they're voting against their own lives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, it's uh, uh, books have been written about this, why, why a lot of people seem to be voting against their own interests election after election. Um, you know, in some respects, they're not, I guess, is one answer in that, which is to say that on cultural issues and social issues, uh, they vote the way they do because they think that party and that candidate represents what they feel on those issues. And yes, on economic issues, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they don't go there or maybe they say, even in, even you know apart from that, I'm going to vote for this candidate. It's not a very good answer to your conundrum because I puzzle over, I puzzle over this uh, as well. Um, but maybe it's you know part of an explanation. Uh, I think I saw Patricia. You had a yes. hand, Patricia Ann. Yeah. Yes. Uh, first of all, congratulations. It was an excellent presentation, and we really needed it at this time of stress. You were right to use that in the beginning. Any chance do you think, and it would have benefit us to have any kind of mandatory voting that would mm -hmm. then force education in the younger grades, teaching students more about voting and the importance of it? Yeah. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's my, uh, well, I, I think there is. Uh, uh, I, I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, and you could certainly make a good argument against mandatory voting. 
Uh, I think myself, I'm a, you know, maybe a minority on this panel, maybe not. Um, I see a lot of benefits to this. Uh, I think it's the subtext of your question mm -hmm. uh, that if you, if you made it mandatory, I don't know what that means. Is there a, you know, a $50 yeah. fine if you don't do it? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it, is it, does it, does, does it stop short of a, um, a requirement, but something to, to in that direction? Maybe you also make the election a national holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you yeah. have, uh, maybe you have the election on a Saturday or a Sunday, like many other countries do, mm -hmm. when fewer people are working. But I think that the combination of some kind of um, requirement with, as you say, early education in the, in the elementary grades, and that continues in middle school and, and, mm -hmm. and beyond, I happen to think it would be. It, it has a lot to. It has a lot to 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 recommend it. It's. I, I think it's unlikely to happen uh, mm. and likely to to stand up in courts, but um, I would like myself the results. I, I think it would benefit uh, mm -hmm. the country. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, Dr. Tracy. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Dr. Sorry. Can can you unmute again there? Here we go. What do you attribute the rise of all the, uh, the importance of all these cultural issues uh, driving the electorate? Growing up in the 50s and the 60s, I don't remember people talking obsessively about things like abortion yeah. and gun rights and homosexuality. Um, what caused all of this? Well, at least at least part of the explanation. I, I don't think it's the full explanation, but at least part of it, I would say, is in fact the proliferation of media outlets. I think it's in part the proliferation of of talk radio, which is something we haven't discussed today, uh, and uh, any number of uh, cable networks. Uh, other forms of uh, um, of media that I think have become so important in our landscape, and they've understood because they're shrewd that you can tap into people's anxieties and and their fears by directing your message to them, and that I think has at least helped make this happen. If you go back to if you go back to let's say the mid '60s. Um, you know, you've got three networks. Uh, you've got uh, local and regional and national newspapers. Um, you've got some radio, but not very much. And that's what you've got. And so Walter Cronkite becomes a sort of arbiter of the kind of, dis the kind of discussion we're going to have. And he and others are going to uh, emphasize mostly important national issues, international issues, issues. Uh, sort of the key policy issues pertaining to actual public policy, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, and you still had the books. I sometimes say this to people. You still had books, you know, focused on these cultural wedge issues, as we call them today. But they would be sold in plain brown wrappers uh, in, the, in the hundreds of copies. Uh, they would be mailed to people. You know, those kinds of books are now on the New York Times bestseller list. And so that's an important change. But I don't know, um, you know, it's a, it's a more complicated answer that you uh, deserve. But I think part of it is that. And then following from that, or perhaps it's not just following from it, maybe it's a kind of symbiotic relationship. Politicians, both at the state level uh, and national level, political aspirants, that is to say candidates who want to become politicians, realizing I can emphasize these cultural issues uh, and I can motivate voters to, to, to back me if I stress these things. Uh, and that's made more possible, it seems to me, in this, in this media environment and especially social media, uh, yeah. as I, I think I mentioned briefly in the talk. So... Well, I'll just, one more thing I will, will bring up. What, what, what 
people don't understand, I think I, many people don't understand is how much power we have uh, as citizens of the United States. We can, we can do, we can be advocates, we can be voters, we can make things happen. And most, most, uh, most things, social services and uh, came, come to us because we advocate them and we can change or what our what our politicians are working toward you know advocacy is not just you know trying to get n more money for corporations it's yeah. for getting um, um, services for the deaf it's for yeah. for services for the disabled and things that uh, we can get if we if we ask for them oh. and uh, that's that's a, a great a great um, Asset. I think asset. it's. I think it's perfectly said, Sandra. I wouldn't change a word that you just uh, articulated, and I think it's. I think it's something that people come to realize, and it's a marvelous thing. Um, it doesn't happen in all instances. You know, you hit roadblocks, you're unsuccessful, but people realize, wait a minute, yeah. I do have power here, and I do have the opportunity to join with others, to create meaningful change in my community and perhaps beyond. Um, I think you're so right about that. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, maybe we should all um, think about things we really want and take them to our, uh, take, take them to our politicians. Here, here. Okay. Well, is anyone else want to say or ask anything? If not, I just thank um, you so much. I see, yeah. I see Esther. Uh, maybe oh, we'll okay. finish with Esther. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, this week before the election, I was talking to my son about the great disparity in our electorate. And he attributes, uh, what did I say, the, the schism uh, going back to the North American Trade Treaty under Clinton. And mm -hmm. I was wondering from an historical, your historical perspective, uh, if you feel that that's a, a time in which there was a uh, the beginning, should I say, of the crack, and that the American worker who who was adversely affected by the North American uh, trade agreement um, began to go along a different political uh, path, and uh, corporations who benefited then began there. There was this huge uh, schism in. Uh, wealth now which possibly was created at that time so where do you fit the north american uh trade, trade yeah. agreement uh let's say even politically yeah i think your your son your son um uh, he may be on to something i think that the schism if we call it that uh to some degree at least precedes nafta uh and you can you can look at uh, what happened to some extent, I would say, beginning maybe with the Reagan administration and Ronald Reagan's argument that, you know, uh, government is the problem, not the solution. Uh, and uh, a view of seeing uh, authority and seeing uh, uh, public officials and government uh, in a way that I think then um, grew from there. Um, the efforts by Newt Gingrich and others uh, in the in the mid '90s, around the time of NAFTA, uh, I think, have contributed to this. NAFTA itself, as I think your son was suggesting, um, though you could make really good arguments, and people have made very good arguments that it benefited not just the American economy, but um, uh, ordinary people uh, all over the country. So there's a, I think there's a. Uh, you know, there's a difference of opinion about what NAFTA represented, um, both nationally and for people. But, you know, in certain circumstances, I can imagine that this uh, mattered, uh, had the kind of effect that your son is suggesting. I just wouldn't personally want to attribute too much to it. Um, uh, I think it's, it both, it, it, pre, it pre, precedes it, or think about it like this, in the absence of NAFTA, um, if we, if we play the what if game, uh, suppose there was no NAFTA, would we 
would we be in a markedly better position today in terms of these schisms? I guess I'm skeptical. Uh, I think it has other, uh, there are other reasons for this, um, but. Okay, any, any others? Yeah, Sheila, you have to unmute. Pardon me? No, there's one more, hold on. Yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to say to that, I get this picture in my mind of the Luddites, you know, destroying their machines. And then I conjure up the picture of Americans, you know, destroying imported cars, uh, Nissans, Hondas, whatever. You know, sometimes history has to flow in one direction. You have to, um, you know, uh, acclimate yourself to new and improved yeah. inventions and trade and whatnot. And th those two images just came to mind. Oh, yeah. No, that's a really good point. And I should say, by the way, that I completely can understand why in a great many communities, um, and often in what we would today call the Rust Belt, but you know, all over the country, it's been a really challenging time the last two, three decades. I, I, I get that and I can, I can see why a way of life that people have had grown up with and that maybe their parents had grown up with and grandparents in these communities, thriving, you know, thriving little towns or bigger towns, maybe sometimes that was viewed romantically, maybe where they were not, remember, remember they were never quite thriving in the way that people remember. Nevertheless, you know, they, they, they had a life there that became increasingly difficult and you could see why globalization um, would be viewed by a great many people with incredible skepticism and why NAFTA fits into that. Um, and why it became very possible for politicians to say, that's the problem. And by the way, that could be politicians on the left and the right. It could be Bernie Sanders and it could be others who would, who would um, identify that um, with, some, with some justification. But uh, I think we're probably reaching the end of our time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss this back to Sandra. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you so much. We're being with us at this critical time in our lives. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's next time, I hope to, like I said, next year, I want to be there with you in person. I have to believe we can do that, but. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, not a scientist, so I can't say for sure. Me neither. But, uh, I will remind people that it's November 10th. Is that right? Uh, the next one will be uh, our son, David Myers, talking about anti-Semitism, past, present, and future. I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs>